Hi, welcome again to Who's Who in Southern Alberta. Well, we had a lot of people show interest in last week's program, so we brought Steve back because they want to hear some more stories. This time we're probably going to be on some more of the serious things, uh, but welcome again, Steve, um, and we'll continue right on with uh, the wonderful world of Koch. I guess. <laughs> <laughs> Steve, you've done a lot of things in the city. Some have been fun, as we heard last week. You were also in city council for a while. What, what years were those? 1969 through 1974. And, so uh, almost into 75, October 75. And how did you like that life? I really enjoyed it to start with, but uh, by the fifth year it started to become a drag. I mean, it was cumbersome. Uh, you could almost predict what was going to happen at the next council meeting. You could al almost predict who was going to complain about what. <clears throat> I mean, it, it just got to the point where I thought to myself, you know, th there has to be more to life than this. Now, I did enjoy it enough that I decided that I'd like to run again because I felt there were still some things that I would like to accomplish that I felt had to be accomplished. But because um, we were working at that time, if you recall, we lost Air Canada and uh, Time Air hadn't started up yet and we had all sorts of problems transportation-wise and of course I was, you know, the founder of the Air Transport Committee of Southern Alberta. So that was the one thing that I really wanted to stay, or, you know, get re-elected on council for was to uh, follow through with that idea of bringing uh, better air service into Lethbridge and Southern Alberta. Mind you, it, it happened anyway because I continued on with the, uh, you know, to operate that particular division that was a part of council uh, for the next couple of years and it all came to pass, so I was satisfied that way anyway. Now you'd wonder, since you were in the bus business, um, why you'd care if they brought in more airlines? Wouldn't it be better for you to simply have everybody taking the bus? Well, I guess that is the attitude that other companies and other people take. The one thing that I always tried to do, my grandparents tried to instill something in my mind, and that was don't try, don't be greedy and don't try and get everything. Try and take a look at the community and what the community's needs are and try and serve those needs. And if you can do that, you'll feel self-accomplished. But if you're trying to grab everything for yourself uh, and be the king of the island and nobody else around, and <clears throat> they said you'll soon lose interest with uh, other people and uh, they said you won't feel fulfilled and I found over the years that they were just right on the money because that uh, gives you more fulfillment I think to be able to take a look at the community needs and try and assist them in wh whichever way you can um, and be a more rounded person as opposed to be a, being a focused person. Now when you, uh, you were talking last week about the development of the, the bus company from your grandfather and so on and I, I think we ran out of time before we were finished on that. Uh, you mentioned how um, you paid off all the debts and, and got the new bus and so on. Um, where did things go from there? Well, <clears throat> we started a program uh, out of Alberta that had never uh, seen the, the light of day before, and that was operating tours to Florida, California, Texas, Alaska, you name it, for, for anywhere from, say, two weeks to uh, 28 days. In length and it was a, a phenomenal success and I think basically because we weren't just running a regular bus down the road we had stewardess service on board we had served complimentary refreshments as we still do today and uh, we gave lectures on all of our tours so that it was an educational tour and we did a great deal of research on every single state and city and so on and so forth that we traveled through and tied it into the history of southern Alberta so that it, and it does tie into the, the history of Southern Alberta, surprisingly enough, a lot of people wouldn't know that. And uh, I got a great deal of help from uh, Alex Johnston, for example. Alex used to go with me on agricultural tours all the time, and we had scientists coming in from all over the world, and we were going through the watershed and all sorts of things. And so uh, it really uh, became so interesting, I started to write Bibles, I call them, mm -hmm. showing the tie-in. And uh, so we make it a, a story. Each tour is a story unto itself. And it always relates back to ourselves here in Southern Alberta. And then after uh, a period of time, the, those tours were highly successful. We had people coming in from Manitoba, Saskatchewan, uh, Alberta, British Columbia, uh, the state of Montana, and North Dakota. That's how fast the word grew through friends and relatives and so on and so forth that we were running these tours out of here. 
we'd have people flying in from Vancouver, for example, to go on our tours. We're not talking about one or two people now either. We're talking about getting as many as a full busload of people that would come in from Manitoba to join our tours. Well, <clears throat> shortly thereafter, uh, let's see, these really started to roll in the mid-70s and they were doing very well until about 1979. And then all of a sudden, that's when the Canadian dollar started to take its nosedive. And the bulk of our uh, clients have always been farmers and ranchers uh, because they usually have more time in the winter time to be able to take mm -hmm. off and do these things. And when the Canadian dollar started to take its nosedive, the interest rates started to climb. We were uh, financed at nine and a quarter percent to start off with, but we didn't have our interest rates pegged and they shot up to 24 and 3 quarter percent and of course we weren't making that kind of money. And um, we went from running over 50 trips a year into the US, major tours, uh, and you know doing millions of dollars uh, in transportation, accommodations, admissions to attractions and so on and so forth, down to $25,000 <laughs> in 1981. So the, the well went dry. We tried to recover by uh, increasing our charter business, but to do that, uh, it started to become increasingly difficult because uh, deregulation came into play shortly thereafter. And so other people started to buy buses, and they were buying old buses, but they were charging half the price that we could afford to charge and they weren't paying the wages we were, had been paying because uh, of course they were driving the buses themselves. And so we saw <clears throat> the great success of the 70s uh, turn into a total disaster in the 80s. By October of 1984 um, I lost my entire fleet of buses. The uh, uh, home that I had in West Lethbridge built on, I had the second house in West Lethbridge built on the park, you know, mm -hmm. the Nicholas Sharon Park, a log house. Um, I lost my garage and property on 3rd Avenue, which was free and clear at one time, but I had to keep mortgaging it to try and keep up to these foolish interest rates and to, rec you know, to just to keep my head afloat because all of a sudden there's no business going into the, into the States anymore. And uh, <clears throat> it wound up that I was sleeping on the floor of my office down here behind my desk for several months. Is that right? Because we just lost everything. We were just wiped right out. The only thing we didn't lose was Exotic International Travel and Tours. We lost the bus company and all of my other holdings. But Exotic, I was smart enough to keep aside in a, private, in a separate corporation. And of course, nobody was hurt except me when we went under because uh, the... Uh, my clients' accounts, their travel and everything was all covered in trust accounts, so we were safe mm -hmm. there. But we had fought for, oh, something like 17 years to break Greyhound's monopoly so that we could have uh, uh, territory to pick up passengers from other countries mm -hmm. of the world. Like they were, Japanese were flying into Calgary International Airport and they wanted to deal with us and the Australians wanted to deal with us and so on and so forth because we had better equipment even though we were a smaller company. That little venture cost us hundreds of thousands of dollars over the years. I, I did a tally once and it worked out to well over $300,000. And I even had to sell off some of my equipment to finance that operation to, you know, to break that monopoly. And so it all happened at once. Murphy's Law was mm -hmm. true to form. <clears throat> and um, we hung on, like I say, to Exotic and we continue to run the tours and everything else and we charter uh, buses from Greyhound to do that. They give us a preferential tariff and we're still able to operate our tours that way. But it's certainly not the same as it was <clears throat> because when you're having to cater to somebody else mm -hmm. uh, as a supplier of equipment, uh, then you lose quality control. And so we, we have to work three times harder now than we ever did when we had our own fleet to maintain the quality control that the customers that have dealt with us for several generations have been, been accustomed to. But um, I'm not complaining. Uh, the, uh, <clears throat> we just bought ourselves a minibus recently again. Uh, that's the f first start back at our own equipment. And we had a court battle uh, last April with the Greyhound and uh, Carefree and some of the other carriers in southern Alberta. They're trying to stop us from getting back on our feet again. And we lost. <laughs> but we'll keep fighting until we get back again. And um, the, uh, 
the tours that we are operating at present, uh, we've got a whole wall full of commendations down there from people. As a matter of fact, some of them have even bought uh, uh, time in the Lethbridge Herald, you know, space in the Lethbridge Herald to thank us for our tours. Uh, and that's kind of ironic because it was the Lethbridge Herald that was largely responsible for us uh, having a lot of financial problems as far as the three, co the two companies and myself are concerned because one day they came out with a big front page ad like that saying that Koch and Canada West Transportation and Exotic Travel bankrupt. Oh great. And it was not true. But what that did is that sparked off a panic in Southern Alberta. We had people lined up for a half a block coming in for refunds that thought that it was a true story because it was in print. And uh, the retraction didn't come till uh, several days later and it was stuck somewhere in the back of the paper and nobody saw it and by that time the damage had been done. <clears throat> and so all of our business just dried right up for several months. And uh, how we survived that I'll never know. So that's why I say that, I said to you before during the break is that, you know, I'm suffering a little bit from burnout. <clears throat> you know, when you, you have so many obstacles that you have to overcome and uh, you overcome them, uh, your community service be is no longer a priority. Mm -hmm. uh, at least it's a limited priority. And so that's why I'm not involved in the Chamber of Commerce and the Tourist Association and things of that nature right now because I had to get some strength back, you know, for myself <laughs> to be able just to survive. Right. And I raised two teenagers by myself at the same time while all this was going on as well. So <clears throat> it, uh, nobody's superhuman. I found that out. <laughs> I used to say I was, but I found out I wasn't. So, so what do you, you haven't given up yet, obviously. You're no. on, on the way. Um, what do you foresee in the future? Well, <clears throat> at the rate our business is growing, and I mean, I'm not, this is not a sales pitch. Our business is growing at an unprecedented rate, even back in the 70s. Uh, our travel business wasn't as good as it is right now. That's the airline uh, business that we do uh, for selling airfares all over the world and our cruise ship tours and so on and so forth. But I've seen a rise in our motor coach business now too. Like our ski buses are full all the time. Um, our tours down to California are becoming more popular every month. And um, I, I firmly believe that uh, we're going to see uh, a real strong solid base of operations again and uh, we do have it right now but you know I'm still skeptical I keep thinking well is the bottom going to drop out or what's going to happen but so far it's been building constantly since Expo in 86 so I I think that uh, we're going to have a tremendous future to look forward to and I'm particularly interested in and excited about this bus building program, you know, where we're going to manufacture these coaches and sell them to other companies that are in the business, in the States particularly. So um, there are a lot of other things that I like to do. I, <clears throat> I, when I was a kid, I used to entertain a lot, and of course I sing on our bus tours and whatnot. I've always loved entertaining. Uh, I love to hear the applause of the crowd. You know, <laughs> that's <laughs> I just have, the way eh? it is, I guess, <laughs> yeah. And, um, so in the manufacturing end of it, you know, that's always been a dream of mine. Entertainment has always been a dream which I'll try to fulfill when I regain finan financial independence, which I hope will come as a result of that manufacturing industry. And uh, of course, we'll always be in the travel and tour business because once it's into your blood, you, you just can't get it out of your blood. And I would like to get involved again in uh, politics in a small way, if possible because I'm always interested in what's going on in social affairs around the world and particularly in our own backyard. And I get so frustrated when I see that, you know, um, it appears that we take two steps forward and five steps backward. And it, it just seems to be a plague on this community and on this province and on this country. And um, I take a look at other places that I travel to and I see that, you know, they're surging forward and we're going backward. It just doesn't make any sense because we're the people that we're supposed to be the model of democracy, we're supposed to be the model of common sense and dignity and everything else, and the people that are involved in the political process right now are robbing us of all of those things, of all of those qualities. And so we only now have a reputation that is fondly remembered. Mm -hmm. But we, we're not fulfilling the promise and the expectation. The, um, you, what do you think of tourism in the future? Like they're trying to develop it as a major 
major thing in, in Canada and Alberta, for example, is pushing tourism. Well, you see, they're giving it lip service. That's all they've ever done in this province. And the reason they're only giving it lip service, and a lot of people aren't aware of this, but there are some multinationals that control the purse strings of government, believe it or not. Not only in the province of Alberta, but in Canada. And those multinationals are the ones that are responsible for saying to the politicians, because they give them the, the money to get them reelected after all, they're the ones that are saying, now look it, this is what will allow you to develop. And that's the way it goes, and I know that for a fact. I've had a lot of battles with our friends up in Edmonton, especially with uh, my good friend uh, Al Adair when he was the Minister of Tourism. Um, we've had some real good all-out wars about the situation in the province of Alberta. And uh, if I may be so bold as to say, one of the multinational conglomerates that owns Banff National Park and, and Lake Louise and Jasper National Park and now Waterton Lakes and, and Glacier Park, they have chosen to steer the tourism dollar into the areas where they have the investment as opposed to areas where they don't have investment. And uh, they even have been so powerful as to have some of their former employees and current um, uh, shareholders uh, as part of Travel Alberta, try that on for size, you know, as deputy ministers of tourism. And I mean, that just should not happen in a democracy uh, that, you know, is supposed to be free enterprise and everything else. It's, uh, they're turning us into a banana republic is what they're doing. And I have said that publicly and I'll say it publicly to anybody's face anytime because I'm not afraid of what, they're, what they can say to me because they know that I'm right. The, um, getting to the more local level, how are you on Sunday shopping? As far as I'm concerned, City Council has no business sticking their nose in private enterprise. That bylaw should not exist. I am allowed to keep my office open 24 hours a day, seven days of the week. I choose to open Monday through Saturday, 9 o'clock till 5.30, because that's all the traffic will bear. And I'm sure that any other businessman is in the same position. There's no way anybody's going to be dumb enough to stay open 24 hours a day, seven days of the week, if they can't afford to. And that goes for Safeways. You can't tell me that the board of directors of Safeways are going to keep the manager on here very long if he starts to lose money. And believe me, if he tried to stay open 24 hours a day, seven days a week, he'd start to, to lose money. So let the marketplace decide. And council isn't smart enough, <laughs> you know, to get involved in private enterprise. And even if they were, they shouldn't. That's not their role. Their role is to take care of the social needs, and that isn't a social need that they should be involved in. Okay, now if you were on council at this time, and you got into this problem that they appear to be in now, how would you resolve it? Well, first of all, I don't know why everybody sits back and lets one alderman uh, write up all these resolutions all the time. When I was on city council, it just didn't work that way. Cam Barnes uh, would write up a resolution, I'd write a resolution, Rex Little would write one, Von Hembroff would write, write one, and we'd present them all. And we'd, we'd vote on all of them. And, you know, the one that had the best idea is the one that came out on top. And I, I'm just dumbfounded, like, these people are like a bunch of sheep. They let Bob Tarlick write all the resolutions and they sit back, he takes all the flack. <laughs> but, you know, uh, it's really pathetic. Bob is a good man, but he's not the smartest guy on that council. And there isn't any one person on that council that has all the answers. So it just befuddles me to think that, you know, here we are. We, we, we have a bunch of guys sitting there and they're letting one person take the flack for everything and uh, none of them have enough imagination to come up with their own ideas and so it makes them look like a bunch of blundering idiots. And it's really embarrassing to me as a citizen and a former alderman uh, to see this kind of garbage going on. Because it's, it's costly not only in terms of dollars but in terms of time and in terms of pride for the people of the city of Lethbridge. So what do you think is going to happen? Well, <clears throat> I think eventually uh, what's going to have to happen is it's going to be challenged in the courts, the bylaw and it'll be thrown out. I think eventually the, the court will decide because of the Human Rights Act or because of the Constitution or, or something that it's, it's not constitutional for the, the city of Lethbridge or any other city for that matter in Canada to be deciding whether private enterprise can serve the public when they want to or not. Mm -hmm. And I'm really surprised that the lawyers of Safeways and these other companies 
are leading these companies down the garden path the way they are. It really upsets me because uh, to tell them to stay open and then try to challenge the bylaw is stupid. When you go to court, are you guilty or not guilty because you're open on Sunday? How do you plead not guilty when you were open on Sunday? It's not the way to challenge the bylaw, is it? Before we run out of time, and we're just about to run out of time, tell me about Lethbridge's major tourist attraction. What should it be? Well, I have drawn up a model that I'd like to show you sometime. It's down in my office of Galt Gardens. It would not cost a fortune to turn Galt Gardens into a spectacular tourist attraction. It would be based on the history of Southern Alberta. Uh, it would be um, um, it would have miniatures of all of the communities of Southern Alberta that, ha that want to contribute in some part of that park, north, south, east, and west. And uh, you could have the Crow's Nest Pass where it belongs in the west and have the mountains and the trees and everything else. Uh, the mountains could be 30 feet high <coughs> and form a perimeter around uh, uh, Galt Gardens and then you'd come into the, uh, the, the, the foothill slope <coughs> which represents uh, north of Calgary, you know, coming over mm -hmm. into the Medicine Hat area where the Badlands are and have the, the landscape shaped that way and so on and so forth. Have Waterton Lakes on the south end with the mountains out. Now that gives you your windbreak, first of all. Uh, then you could have uh, the mountains and the foothills and everything else have them set up so that they really look authentic, only they're in miniature. And you'd have a miniature Fort McLeod and a miniature uh, uh, Frank Slide and, and a miniature Waterton Lakes and so on and so forth and have all these communities uh, make that contribution. Have the people come in and volunteer to do the work uh, representing their community in the park. And then you do walking tours through the park and have interpreters during the you know, 12 months of the year. There are retired people here that could do that interpretive uh, situation. Uh, you could block off uh, 7th Street and use it exclusively for parking, you know, have an area for parking buses. We could have uh, built into the, the, one of the mountains on the north side uh, by the, the new shopping mall there, Park Place, you could have a band shell there <clears throat> built right into the mountain. And you could, inside of the mountains, you could also have uh, certain things. You know, there's no waste uh, space or area. Uh, now, in this band shell, I really get excited when I think about this thing because it would really, I, I know that people come from all over the world to see this. It would be so unique. Uh, you could put on plays 12 months of the year in that band shell. You could have it set up that way. And people could observe from the outside. But you could have uh, your shelters and everything set up in such a way that people could observe it from the outside, regardless of the elements. Does this have to be in Galt Gardens? Mm -hmm. It doesn't have to be in Galt Gardens. It's just that the controversy over Galt Gardens and what to do with it at the time to make it viable and usable by the people uh, was so strong that I felt that, well, okay, here is an alternative for it. It could be done in the Lethbridge Cooley Hills. So you designed this little model. Too bad we don't have it here, but uh, you designed it all in... This is when you were being burned out, was it? This is yeah, yeah. Past time. <laughs> and um, what have you done with it? Have you shown it to people? Yeah, I took it to, to City Hall and I showed it to the Economic Development Department and I showed it to Bob Tarlick and, uh, um, you know, it's, it's just died a slow death. How long ago is this? <laughs> well, that was last year. <clears throat> and, uh, you know, I know it would work. It would work anywhere in the world, for any city in the world. And you would have several forms of transportation to take people around in the park. Like, that's a big park. I went out and I paced it out. And I, I started to imagine where everything could go to see if it would be practical. You could have areas there for people to have their lunches, for example, 12 months of the year. You could have a water fountain. You could have a little pond there that could be a pond in the summertime and skating in the wintertime uh, when, when people go for their lunches or anything. Use your imagination, you know. You, there are so many things that you could do with a darn place. It's a, a real crime just to see it sit there and, and waste away and have people arguing whether there should be a parking uh, installation underneath it or not. What do you think of this um, Western Interpretive Center? Um, well, the, <coughs> an, th this is kind of what I had in mind for, for the park, like it would be a Western Interpretive Center. Uh, I don't know what their plans were or what their ideas were for a Western Interpretive Center, but uh, it was my idea that this would be uh, talking all about our history and things that actually still exist and so on and mm -hmm. so forth. And uh, you'd have, say, a grandfather that came in from the Crow's Nest Pass and he brings his whole family in and says, hey, me and my buddies, this is what we did. Mm -hmm. And then 
<clears throat> when you've got it laid out like a map like that, the tourists that come in from other areas would say, oh, that looks like an interesting place. Okay, we'll go there. So they hop in their cars and they drive out to the Crow's Nest Pass and so on and so forth. So it would work. There's no question. Well, Steve, yeah, I got a faith. You got an imagination. You're an idea, man. <laughs> no question about that. And I want to thank you for, for being here the last couple of weeks. Um, I'm sure the people have enjoyed it. Uh, people that have known you for years, and if they haven't known you, they've known about you. Now they get to hear the stories right from the face itself. And I want to thank you and come again, won't you? Certainly will. And the rest of you, we hope you'll come next week and again meet somebody from who's who in Southern Alberta. See you.